recently of scrapping the long-standing definition of marriage. Uh, our first speaker will be Francis Goldscheider, Professor of Family Science at the University of Maryland. Uh, she'll be followed by Maggie Gallagher, Senior Fellow of the American uh, Principles uh, Project, and Helen Alvare, uh, Professor of Law at George Mason University School of Law. So, Professor Goldschein. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best to be clear and um, make the points that can be understood by lawyers, but I do have a brother who's a lawyer and a son-in-law who's a lawyer, and it's not at all clear to me that either of us, any of us, get each other, but um, <laughs> I, will, I will work on that. And um, I'm already going to slightly apologize for the title of my paper, which is up there, because I'm trying to draw clear contrasts. Um, all sociologists know that a difference of you know, 3% or 5% or 7% if you have enough cases is significant. And if someone then says to you, but I know someone who's not like that, you say, it's okay, it's okay, on average. You know, so, but I'm trying to draw strong contrast, and that's what I will hope to make clear. Okay, and since I can pick this up from the introduction, <laughs> I can say, is there one best kind of family? And um, I assure you there can be many criticisms of the Canadian study, but I won't go into that. But it is true that many people believe that the best kind of family for raising children, and I think we do think that children matter, maybe you shouldn't wag the entire dog, its tail or whatever, but are certainly a big issue. Um, and many people think that it should be some kind of heterosexual couple, the biological parents thereof, though I think most people who know modern adopted fam children families, is there a problem? <laughs> oh, <laughs> just so you know who I am, all right. Um, might say that biology is it is usually but not necessarily an important form of commitment. You can make you know, evolutionary arguments that say, you know, your biological children you're tied to because you've known them all along or you, you know, but we, we know that there are biological parents who are pretty lousy and um, we know that people who adopt children can be highly invested, committed and excellent parents. So I'm gonna stay away from biology, but I'm going to stay more on the sociological, historical, socio-demographic side and say heterosexual couple, man employed, woman at home. And that's really what we talk about in terms of the separate spheres and I will be dealing with that historically. And of course we could have a few, you know, exceptions. There's actually a question like this on some surveys, you know, what's the best kind of family for when people have a child under five or a child under six or something like that. And you know, there's sort of a, a now a waiver that it's okay if she works a lot of the time, but she should be, if, if she can't pull it off, <laughs> she should work part time or quit while the kids are young, because that should be her priority. And everything else they see is a deviation. And it's a strongly moral, I would say, given the previous session, deviation, whether it's two serious career couples who are both gone from seven to seven or whatever, and um, um, single parents who we see is not really adequate at all. And let's not forget that this is, session is really about same-sex couples and how on earth could they possibly be good parents. And why do we think that? Um, there's been 40 years of effort to try to document that working mothers are bad for kids. Um, there's also about the same period uh, research on that when women take on paid jobs they're more likely to divorce and of course that's not good for kids we're pretty sure or at least instability in general and I'm going to tell you briefly that maybe maybe not 
There's no question that employed women, particularly in a situation where there's very little support for families, like the US, tend to have fewer kids than women who stay home and have lots of money from their spouses. They, have, you know, they can manage on one salary what other people need to have two salaries to pull off. Um, and so there's a pressure on women to have their children at the right time. I imagine most of the women law students in this room have struggled with the whole question of when is too late or when is, how can we do this? Um, and you know, do I have to wait until I make partner and so forth? But 40 years of worried research has not found that children of working mothers do any less well. And I can't tell you how much money has been spent trying to document that they are suffering. And I was told by many people as an early adopter of the female work lifestyle <laughs> that um, any number of people told me that I would never know how bad off my children would be until they were grown, even if I said they seem to be fine now and they seem to have a stable life and they're used to having me when they had me and used to having other kind of care when they had other kind of care and um, you know, holidays and every night, all night and so forth made a big difference. But you know, we're also worried about single parents. There's a lot more research on that now and that's given the trend both employed couples and the kinds of union instabilities that lead to single parents. Now, most of the studies seem to suggest that the, if you know enough about the resources that these families have, and I, I know the Canadian family doesn't know nearly enough about their resources, the Canadian study, um, an awful lot of what you find is that they don't have nearly enough money. And if you can find some nice professor you know, I was a single parent for about five years between spouses and they seemed to do all right, but I had, you know, a reasonable salary and a stable life and so forth. But there is some evidence that parenting is not quite as consistent in single parent families than in two parent families when you're busy trying to do everything and there's not a lot of backup. It's amazing how kids can take advantage of the fact that you can't gang up on them anymore and maybe they can gang up on you better. And so the question is, where do, you know, how, where does all, how does all of this apply to some various sets of LGBT parents? And in fact, Canadian study is not, doesn't have nearly enough cases, and we know very little. We have some very small studies that suggest that they're doing fine. We have some other studies that suggest they're not. You know, the single parent studies seem to suggest that two parents are better than one. So that you know, gay parents and lesbian parents are ahead on that score at least. Um, but do they have to be heterosexual? Does one have to work and one stay home? We don't really know. Why did we think it would be bad for women to work outside the home? This is where I want to carry us quickly, because this is what most of my research is all about. Because, I don't know, we had the Bible earlier this morning. We thought that the family always everywhere was defined by men going out to work and women taking care of the home and the family and that it was eternal and even biblical and um, that's the nature of gender roles should always be and that's just the crock. So um, I found some fine family in imagery that, you know, I'm old enough here, I'm older probably than almost anybody here that, you know, I was a child of the 50s. I knew that women were supposed to stay home and, you know, be passive. I read Freud assiduously, you know, all this stuff. Um, so I knew it was all Flintstones. I knew it was all, you know, I had to sort of find out by myself that I could do more than I was supposed to. So I found some good, what I call caveman imagery of what people like to think was the basis of the modern family, that men hunt while women cook and men are, so there they are with, off with their spears and there she is grinding away and men are supposed to of course <laughs> dominate women with their physical strength because that's the natural order of things. Men should make decisions because of course they're stronger and that should really matter. Um, and we call this construction the separate spheres that men are, go out in the public sphere 
and they bring home the bacon, and women stay home and take care of the children and nurse the sick and cook and clean and you know, um, put on parties for their husbands and colleagues and all of the good things that a 1950s wife was supposed to do. But the anthropologists have now been telling us for about 50 years that this vision of the separate spheres is very much a myth, that um, in pre-agricultural economies, women's labor provided 60 to 70 percent of the family calories by gathering. This was a real shock when I first read this article in the late 60s or early 70s. It just wasn't right. You know, men brought home the bacon and the women cooked it. How could it be that families were being supported um, by, in large you know, majority of the cases, by women's gathering activities because apparently hunting was not always successful. So this raises what I consider a fundamental question is, you know, we've gotten rid of the biblical, we've gotten rid of the pre-agricultural, you know, how old really is the vision that I grew up with and it still lingers in the psyches of everybody here of the separate spheres. Or does it go back to the caveman? I just said no, or have important things changed? So I'm going to hit you with one, one uh, complex, <laughs> but pretty <laughs> little graph that is a new way to tell the story of the Industrial Revolution. And I won't spend a lot of time on it, but just because it's so pretty, I want to give it to you straight. Um, this top line that separates the green from the blue is the standard story of the Industrial Revolution. It's men's move out of agriculture. It's the fact that when we had you know, non-human energies to mobilize and use and so forth, men became more productive when they gave up the plow and the mule and whatever else they were using and moved off and went to factories and offices and farms. And if you follow that line up, you see that a very tiny proportion of men at this point are still farmers. Of course, the line goes all the way out to 2040, but even if you <laughs> take it back to real data, you know, around 2000, you still see that there's almost nobody left in agriculture. It's almost all, you know, machines and so forth. And, you know, if you want to add in a few more, like the people who are working in the, throughout the food industry, you can get it up for like 15 or 20 percent. But in terms of what people do, agriculture used to be what everybody did starting in 1790, only 25 percent of men were not farmers in the United States. And my argument is that if you just focus on that line, when men are farmers in a subsistence agricultural economy, guess what their wives are doing? Guess what their daughters are doing? Guess what their widowed mothers are doing? They are working as hard as they can to keep food on the table and they are um, <coughs> Um, very much part of this agricultural household economy and the idea of separate spheres is just that stuff. They're both in the same sphere face to face as sociologists would tend to say. You know, yes, men are stronger. Yes, women spend more time nursing babies. But what we know is that men were involved in training their children to become um, good farmers and good spouses for farmers, which was their interest in their daughters. Uh, at a very early age, and they were involved with their children. The lower line that divides the blue and the magenta, I guess you could call it, is a somewhat different line. And you know, these two lines have never been drawn like this before. This is my contribution. You know, if the upper line is the non-agricultural jobs of men, the lower line is simply female labor force participation. But it's le legitimate to do that because they didn't count women who worked in agriculture. They were just you know, wives, daughters, and widowed mothers. If you look at any of the census data, the wives, daughters, and widowed mothers of farmers were treated as you know, housewives and daughters and so forth and not as economically active. It was just a gender-based assignment. So when women start getting paid, they have to pay attention to them. And so they move out. And so the process of industrialization started pulling men out in a major way where the curve changed around 1850 and it's pretty much finished by 2000. 
whereas women look very much like men, but about 100 years later, that they could be more productive and take care of their families and provide the support of their families by moving out into better jobs. And um, I already said all of that, and I already said all of that, and I already said all of that. But the whole <laughs> point of it is that our view of the separate spheres, let me come back, just because I'm so fond of it, <laughs> is very recent. <coughs> you know, it's basically from 1850 to 1950, which of course is long enough in any of our individual lives and our parents' individual lives and the imaginations of you know, the famous scholars of why it's important to divide up the family this way. Talcott Parsons thought it was totally ridiculous, the thought that any woman should work because then she would compete with her husband. And um, Freud, of course, knew that you had to be female and male and so forth. And Gary Becker, the family, family economist theorist, um, needed people to specialize because that was more efficient. If she specializes in home production and he specializes in outside the home production, they will produce more. It's like international trade for those of you who wandered through macroeconomics at some point in your life. But if you follow the sort of blue middle part of the graph, you see that once upon a time, there wasn't much in the way of a separate spheres. Most people were up in the green part. And if you move out, with some reasonable projection, and some people could argue with my how much of a stall there is, and I'm not going to worry about that right now, that and I certainly don't have women moving all the way up to men's level, and I'm agnostic on you know, what, true equality, whatever that might be, or dotting every I and crossing every T and equalizing everything, but there's no question that most women now expect to work, that most men now expect their partners to work, um, that female employment is now normative and normal and expected, and that has attacked the separate spheres from the other side. So let me get back to where I can move on to. You know, we can go into more detail than I have time for on why women moved out later than men and their good reasons, and we won't spend any much time on that. And as a demographer, of course, I care that um, women's lives changed and that made it possible for them to integrate work and family in a way they really couldn't before, that their adult years had really been their child raising years and by the time the last child was gone, you know, they were either dead or decrepit and their husbands were dead and so forth under regimes of low fertility and low mortality. Yep, I'm getting there. <laughs> and. Um, Suddenly, they were having fewer children with longer lives, and somehow work could come in. And we don't yet know how much the separate spheres area will shrink, but it's clear that two working parents can raise children successfully. And the data are very clear about that. But do they have to be, given this audience, heterosexual? Can male couples parent together? That's often behind the lifestyle argument, what sort of parents can, I mean, we're not even sure men can parent. <laughs> but homosexual men, two of them together, my God. And of course, can women support a family when, you know, if you do a little bit of the historiography of both of these major movements, you will find that, well, I haven't even gotten to yet, but that as women started moving out to employment, there was an enormous investment in putting it down that it was pin money, that it really didn't mean anything, that no one should count on her salary. Um, the first house that I bought, the, the, the bank didn't want to count my salary toward the mortgage because God knows I might have another child and so forth. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of sort of counter, but since I did say that men can parent, I want to say it whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, we now have what I call the second half of the gender revolution, which is with, when men, women first press against the separate spheres by going to work. And I particularly spend time in Sweden where this is even much more real than it is here, though it is real here. This is based on US data that at least on weekends, men's are now, men are now spending as much time with their kids as the moms, and that's too much detail. And since single male parents are doing quite well, two male parents would do even better. And what about lesbian families? Well, we already know that women can earn money. It's not just pin money. We have, many of us, good jobs and 
so forth, and two parents are better than one. So two women together can do even better than a single mom. And we now know that women's earnings are good for the family. Everybody's earnings are good for the family, and I wish families and kids got more money. We also know that men's involvement is good for the family. And I could tell you in lots of detail that I don't have that now that the gender revolution has moved into the second half with men helping out, helping out, being fully partners in the family, that it actually is good for the family. That if working women had fewer children than non-working women, men who move in to taking some responsibility for their home and families mean that they have more children. The funniest example, and I'll just hit you with this for a second, is that the, the parts of Europe that we all thought were the you know, Catholic, high fertility, everything, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, now have the lowest fertility in the world because they have neither state support for families nor male support for families. And we're getting more details, not just on fertility, but on union stability that, um, at least in Sweden, and we have some evidence for the US that their relationships are more stable, which in my view is better for kids if men participate in domestic tasks. And we know it's good for kids, because kids spend time with their fathers. And I always thought that the way in for men in the house was going to be the kids that they would, kids are more fun anyway than most of the other tasks around the house. And, but once they get into it, they figure out that it's good for the kids to have clean clothes and good food and a relatively hygienic environment. And we now have evidence that it's good for men, that marriages are happy. Some studies at least show they have more and better sex. Is it good for women? Some women resist sharing and they want it all done their way and they want to control it just the way men did over the car in the 1950s. You know, they might let her drive it, but not, you know, she wasn't clearly responsible. And there are a lot of women who feel that way about babies and men really can't do it. But if you can work it out, you can find out that it's just wonderful to have two people doing it and not just one. The balance is positive, the gains are worth it. And sadly, no one would bother if our gay and lesbian parents were single parents. No one would say, yeah, lifestyle. <laughs> but if you really have two parents, two committed parents, that's what kids need. And what kids need then is parents who love them, who are committed to them throughout. And um, more parents are better than fewer in my every study I've ever seen. And stable, long-term committed relationships are better for children and for adults. And therefore, what should the law and public policy do? I'm finished, I am. Um, we want to encourage parents to stay together. And one of the best ways to do it is to reduce the financial and parenting stress that is so overwhelming in the US where we expect young adults, people in their late 20s and early 30s before they've made very much money to be totally responsible for children with no help from the state, you know, a little bit of tax relief, you know, which it means almost nothing to most people. So I love being in Scandinavia where the feminists all love to say, the men only do 25% of the family leave. And I say, <laughs> I, would, I would give a lot <laughs> for us to get up to 25%. And uh, thank you. Sorry, George, can we get rid of that? Just put the computer Work aside so that Maggie can put hers and then I can put my notes. Oh, I left my water. Maggie, can you reach me my water? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, do I what? No, I don't need to. I don't have a, I'm a very late adopter of technology. Um, well, Thank you, and uh, thank you for including me in this discussion. I'd like to preface my remarks uh, by saying I'm not a legal scholar. I'm not going to pretend to be one. I have been both a close observer and a theor theoretician, and of course, a particip participant in the same-sex marriage debate. And um, I'd like to offer you some reflections on, on uh, Windsor from the point of view that may, I, I would assume the majority of people in this room uh, don't have, which is what it feels like to read the decision, what to make of the decision, 
if you believe very strongly that the classic understanding of marriage is the union of male and female is important. I want to say first though, I want to thank Francis uh, Goldscheider. There is much that we share, an enormous amount. Uh, that, Even a co-author. <laughs> that, that, oh, I'm sorry. Even a co-author, Linda. Wait. Oh, yes. Uh, that, I'm sorry. That, uh, that we share much that I agree with on the importance of involved uh, fathering and stability for children, et cetera. Um, it's not a debate, and I'm going to avoid the, the uh, in, the excitement I have in hearing you talk, there's a lot I would like to engage with you about, but I'll stick to what I, I wanted to say. Um, I would agree, I, 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 when you read Windsor, I would agree that Justice Kennedy is putting an end to the marriage debate, uh, the debate over same-sex marriage, as a legal and civil matter, insofar as the Supreme Court can do so. Um, it may take 18 months, it may take three or four years, but it's very hard to read Windsor without seeing uh, Kennedy. We now have five votes for a constitutional right to same-sex marriage on the Supreme Court. Um, the, my topic for today is called the Kennedy Doctrine, Moral Disagreement and the Bare Desire to Harm. And I guess the first point uh, to make is that I think there is a Kennedy Doctrine evolving that is, Scalia pointed out, it is distinct from any established Supreme Court uh, doctrine or framework. Uh, it's not clear who holds it except for Kennedy, but as he is the decisive swing vote, it's pretty important. Kennedy relies in Windsor on seven Supreme Court precedents, three of which he personally authored. And the Kennedy Doctrine kind of eschews the, uh, he, what he did not do is clearly state that sexual orientation is a protected class subjected to a certain level of scrutiny. Um, he, you know, in, instead creates a doctrine that uh, is rooted in an idea of human dignity that uh, when a government does something unusual, and Kennedy note does not view the adoption of same-sex marriage as unusual. It is the move by Congress to define federal marriage for federal law as the unusual thing. Um, that the uh, legitimacy of that, yeah, <clears throat> let me see, at, at the heart of what's disturbing to me about the Kennedy Doctrine is the translation of the desire, a, a, a collapse of the distinction between affirmation and stigmatization, which is, I think, reflective of the gay marriage debate and, to a certain extent, the family structure uh, debate as a whole. The equation, in other words, of the classic understanding of marriage and the desire to protect it with a bare desire to harm gay people, their children, and their families. Um, the dismissiveness with which the entire, the, the arguments uh, are not so much uh, repudiated as simply ignored for the classic understanding of marriage. And the, um, I don't know what to say, the lacks, lack of reciprocity in the understanding of the messages the court can send. So under the Kennedy, under, in Kennedy's view, it's very clear that the definition of marriage is one man and one woman sends a message to gay people that is harmful to their dignity as well as to some concrete material interests. But his focus is really on the dignitary harm. And he is less clear that the, uh, in adopting, he's less clear or less even able to comprehend that the rejection of the classic understanding of marriage is also therefore likely to send a message, right? So, you know, let me begin by stating what should be obvious, but maybe people on my side don't say that much. It, it is obvious that malice and animus towards gay people exists and that some people's support of marriage uh, is, in, is motivated by animus towards gay and lesbian people. In fact, a lot of politics these days seems to be motivated <laughs> by animus towards someone or something. Um, but the equation in the Kennedy Doctrine of uh, that, that the absence of equal affirmation is the presence of stigmatization leaves us very little room for uh, moral pluralism or for respecting moral disagreement. <coughs> the absence of affirmation is the presence of stigmatization and the desire to harm. That's 
And uh, I would say that in the other debates around marriage, um, an effort was made to collapse that distinction. When I started debating family structure in the late 80s, uh, mostly in the 90s, and I would go around the country and I would make the argument that the marriage really matters because children need their mom and their dad. And uh, it, in the, the late 80s, a lot of people wanted to say, if you believed that you were a moral zealot denying scientific evidence who hated single mothers. <clears throat> I myself was an unwed mother at the time. I was an unwed mother for 10 years. The gap between the happy talk in the 80s about how wonderful the retreat from marriage uh, is for women and equality and progress and children and my own experience as a, an extremely privileged unwed mother is part of what propelled me into the marriage debate in the first place. Um, so the, the lack of reciprocity, you know, uh, I, the, the understanding that the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage carries a, a message, but the lack of any, it even being intelligible that the inclusion of same-sex couples could also carry a message about the nature and purpose and meaning of marriage, and also about people who hold to the classic understanding of marriage. I first started thinking about this in the context of debates in Illinois after adopting a civil union law the next step after, after the immediate next step was to exclude from uh, adoption and foster care any adoption agencies that do not place children with same-sex couples. Um, and there was a very vigorous awareness of the dignitary harm to gay people if uh, the government cooperates with adoption agencies that don't do gay adoption like Catholic Charities or Evangelical Lutheran, but there seemed to be no awareness of all of the flip side of that message. What does it say to the Catholics or the Evangelical Lutherans in that state if the government is excluding their adoption agencies from, in, from the task of helping orphans find home because they don't share the state's new understanding, its new morality on homosexuality and same-sex couples? You can, I mean, there are a few. Kai Feldblum, I think, does understand there's a dignitary harm and believes that it is outweighed by the need to protect diversity. But most people really don't um, are, it seems to me that in our theoretical framing of it on the same-sex marriage side, it's, um, you're kind of speaking to a blank wall often when you ask people to recognize changing the understanding of marriage can have an impact on marriage, and particularly if you do so on the argument that the classic understanding of marriage is rooted in hatred and bigotry towards gay people, which may be true for some, but I don't believe is the great truth about it. Um, and I've thought a lot about this problem of unintelligibility because I think I'm pretty articulate. I've been in a lot of hot button public debates and I've seldom been in a debate where I, it's, um, you know, I, I will lay out, which I'm not gonna do here, but the, the classic case for marriage is rooted in male-female difference, not necessarily in separate spheres, but in the reality that the society has a special stake in bringing together male and female to make and raise their children together, both because of the good um, that are produced by that marriage and because of the harms that are produced when children are instead created in sex low commitment sexual unions um, and uh, uh, women end up parenting alone and children end up deprived of uh, the experience of being loved by the, both of the two people who made them. Um, that's a very short version of it. And uh, so uh, when I do this, I will often find that half the room will nod and say yes, yes. And the other half, I've actually, I think I was at Yale when I made this argument and Evan Wolfson stood up and said, the one thing you did not hear was an argument against same-sex marriage, right? And I'm standing there, I was like right there, I was there making the argument. Um, and uh, so what I'm trying to contribute today, what, I'm, what, I, what I want to um, offer is some beginnings of an explanation for this, uh, the, for the unintelligibility to gay marriage advocates of the arguments for the classic understanding of marriage. And I think it goes to the question of what counts as a moral argument in the strong liberal framing. And the person who 
most helped me, who uh, kind of set off a light bulb in my head, is a social psychologist named Jonathan Haidt, who's one of the pioneers of the fear, field of empirical research into the psychological foundations of morality. And he's done uh, interviews and questionnaires now with thousands of people and used their responses to try to gain some insight into what is distinctive about Western liberalism and what is lost in it. And, and he uses this in part to distinguish, to understand the difference between conservatives, uh, Western conservatives and Western liberals. Um, and he notes that uh, people who self-describe liberals, especially people who describe themselves as very liberal, are the worst at predicting the moral judgments of moderates and conservatives, right? In other words, people who are conservative or moderate can predict what a liberal would think, but uh, self-described liberals have a very hard time putting them in the shoes of conservatives or moderates. That's a, a kind of phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> And I'm not doing justice to his theories or his research, but the basic, uh, his basic conclusion is that liberalism in America is a two-foundation morality. Liberals have a very strong taste for care and harm, care for others and the prevention of harm to people, and a very strong taste for fairness or equality. And he says that everybody actually cares about those things. <laughs> Conservatives care about them a little bit less, but they're still very care harm. You know, we debate about what care harm requires, what fairness requires, but they are um, understood to be important moral considerations across the board. But that uh, conservatives, not only here, but in most of the rest of the world, the, the mainstream of most of the rest of the world, traditional societies, um, have uh, three or four other taste receptors that liberals have a hard time comprehending even as morality, for example, uh, sanctity and purity, in-group loyalty, you know, uh, local altruism, caring more about the people who are close to you than the universal principle. And um, that, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why the marriage, the gay marriage debate is um, so much more difficult to achieve disagreement on, including more difficult for liberals to have respect if not agreement, for the views of those with whom they disagree than the abortion issue. The, the abortion issue actually fits very nicely into the liberal framework of care, harm, fairness. Those are, those are the only moral considerations. And the debate is about a debate whether the nascent human life is a human being who we are obliged not to harm and have to care for and protect, or whether other interests dominate that. So it's pretty easy for liberals even if they disagree, to understand that point of view. But I think the interests, uh, certainly I'm going to speak personally here, uh, in the marriage debate don't fit neatly into that classical liberal framework. Instead, in a concern for marriage, a concern for marriage is rooted in a concern for the sexual order and for the harms that result when that sexual order is not supported or upheld generally. So, um, the, to, to, to speak to our, uh, the introduction, the family is a system of obligation which by its nature constrains self-determination and individual autonomy. Um, individuals relating in free autonomy are not people bound by obligations that persist over time and uh, lead to sacrifices. And I think a lot of what we're experiencing in the Western world is an effort to, to formally call the West, whatever we call the, the Western world now that we don't use those terms, um, developed world, I guess. Uh, the, the, uh, so the, a lot of what we're doing with the family theoretically and conceptually is we're, we're trying to remake it so that it fits better within that classical liberal framework of freely choosing individuals autonomously. The one thing that kind of explodes it is children, which, right, they don't, they don't fit into that framework. And so um, I, I really actually do very much appreciate the work of liberals uh, like Francis, who are working hard on finding places within the, the liberal system of values to support that essential work. Um, the, since I was a young woman, the sexual revolution, the gender revolution, uh, 
has achieved many important benefits for individuals and for society. But the retreat from marriage, in my view, has, and the retreat from any sense of normative sexual order at all, uh, has caused an immense harm. Okay, it's a, you know the the heart of the heart of why I started into the marriage debate when it was about divorce and unmarried childbearing, and continuing the gay marriage debate, is not that I'm obsessed with gay people that I think gay people are bad parents or bad people or bad citizens. It's that I uh, have seen visibly in the lives of people around me, in my own children, that the retreat from marriage is causing immense amount of harm and suffering. And uh, I would say that I uh, viewed my hope, my hope in entering the gay marriage debate was actually that we could keep heteronormativity and eschew homophobia, that we could create a society in which LGBT people feel safe and included and respected as our fellow citizens and friends and neighbors and sometimes family members, but in which the ideal, uh, the, you know, the unique function of marriage and its importance in the sexual order for the ordering of sexual unions that give rise to new life could similarly be re respected and protected. And I think the Windsor decision clearly collapses that hope, and it collapses, as, as I said, around this poll of understanding the absence of affirmation or idealization as the presence of stigmatization. So while I always understood when I went around as saying the ideal for children is a married mom and dad did not imply that I wanted to stigmatize or hurt single mothers, in the gay marriage debate, these two things had been collapsed. Um, and the second, my second fear that the uh, adoption, if the government adopts this new norm of marriage equality, that it will lead to a, tr a retreat for the liberty of those of us who have the classic understanding of marriage is um, being realized faster than I ever imagined. The number in particular concern for me is the number of professions that are being, you're being close to you if you are publicly opposed to same-sex marriage. Well, you probably, you may or may not have heard that the state of Washington now, a judge who privately said in his, when asked by his staff that he didn't think he would perform same-sex weddings because of his religious beliefs, has now been judicially reprimanded for that. It's, an, it's unacceptable even to state that belief in private and be a judge in the state of Washington. There are many other professions I could talk about. I'm going to run out of time, so I just want to end on the baker. How many of you have heard of Melissa, of Sweet Cakes by Melissa, the Oregon baker? So, um, I'm struck by that case. This is a, a, an evangelical woman who had a bakery and she was happy to bake cakes for gay people. She, she did not want to participate, to bear false witness to her evangelical worldview by participating or facilitating it in a same-sex wedding. And when the lesbian couple, understandably, it's not pleasant to know that somebody doesn't support your wedding, uh, they went to the, the uh, the, the body that governs discrimination and filed a complaint. It created a media firestorm, which uh, the gay rights groups went to the corporations that were her customers and threatened problems for them if they didn't withdraw their custom from her. Um, she received death threats. The, her, her bakery truck, her, she and her husband's bakery truck, parked in front of their home in a rural area was trashed, but nothing was taken from it. And the net result is she's now out of the bakery business. She has five, she and her husband have five children. I was in Oregon giving a speech and I'm told that he's hauling garbage now to try to put food on the table. And what I want to say is this, I think, I'm a Catholic, I'm not an evangelical. I think I could figure out why I could bake a cake for a gay couple and that wouldn't be a problem if I were a baker. So without even endorsing her particular conscience uh, views, I, I do want to say, look at the disproportion between the harm and the punishment, right? Um, the, the, she, she, this is not Jim Crow. She was not trying to systematically exclude people from society. She was trying to live her own life according to her own values. And she was uh, discovered that the law now makes it very difficult for people like her. And what that reminds me, to go finish up with my last point here, there is, although in general, liberalism has a problem with supporting an order that causes concrete harm to an individual, right? The exception is actually if the order being supported is the norm of equality, in which case putting 
this woman, you know, uh, to, out of business, seems to be viewed as an unambiguous good because it supports the moral norm of equality. And I would like to hope that we can do better than the Kennedy Doctrine and that we can come to an appreciation of the views of millions of your fellow Americans as something other than the bare desire to do harm, even if you don't agree that they've ordered the goods of the world in a correct way. Thank you. No, no, that's okay. okay. Greetings. Uh, my name is Helen Alvare, and uh, I am here to test your pre lunch patience <laughs> <laughs> with me and with yourself. Um, I'm here to talk about the relationship between children and marriage. Um, I think it's clear on its face in the same sex marriage cases. Also, if you look at the legislative hearings, Constitutional Convention in Massachusetts, that they give no extended treatment to states' claims that <coughs> marriage between people of opposite sex protects children's well-being. Um, and what I've done is, is a really close analysis of the leading cases on same-sex marriage uh, that have approved it in the states and the Windsor case. And what I see is that they have abandoned about a 120-year constitutional uh, marriage family law tradition stating that states' interest in marriage are consistently linked with their interest in children but even more interestingly, in a focus of my comments today, is that these cases posit that adults' role respecting children is to prepare those children for their taking their place at a future time right, in society. It's, in other words, an outward-facing, child-oriented focus. By contrast, you'll see in the same-sex marriage opinions a sort of recasting, or to, to play on a title I'll give this paper, a reconceiving of children's well-being and development so that it serves adults' interests. So it's much more an inward-facing versus a future or outward-facing uh, or a child-facing take on what, what children in the family are. I think this portends difficulties not only for children reared in same-sex households, but really for all children, and particularly it's a problematic model for the most vulnerable children in America, those who are suffering from the loss of everything, uh, precipitating what is uh, being called by some sociologists like Andrew Cherlin and Brad Wilcox, the Latin Americanization of America, this gigantic gap between the rich and the poor and between the families of the privileged and the unprivileged. So I'm going to do two things. Did I like take this off this already, Ben? I'm, I'm, I'm Cuban. I talk with my hands. So just <laughs> be prepared. Um, I'm going to do three things. One, talk about um, states' interest in children um, as an intrinsic part of their interest in marriage. First, familiarize you a bit, much longer in the written paper, with the constitutional history on this. Then review the same-sex marriage cases in Windsor. And then finally, reflect on a meaning of the reconceiving of children and marriage that takes place uh, in recent cases. Um, so starting with um, the constitutional history, um, if you parse line by line really every um, Supreme Court opinion um, up to the mid-80s, uh, mid-1980s in the United States, you'll find about 120 years' worth of opinions that persistently say that states' interest in marriage are um, these two. And by the way, they, they, they're not biblical. These are strictly secular uh, opinions referring to secular facts. Number one, the interest is in procreation. And you'll see lots and lots of opinions, including Loving versus Virginia, the anti-miscegenation opinion, that says, you know, families give us the members of society itself. The other interesting thing is that even in cases, um, and I do a, a real parsing of this in the writing, but no time here, in cases where people are seeking rights respecting marriage, the court always says marriage and procreation. In cases where they're seeking rights to procreate, the court always says procreation and marriage. So it introduces the other even when it's not an issue in the case. It's just sort of a normal thing that the court did. And um, it has a second aspect of these cases, is really how marital families socialize their children. 
that this is where people have kids, they form them, they educate them uh, to take their place in a functioning democracy. Uh, some of the most interesting language in that, it's my longer paper, um, comes from, say, the father's rights cases where non-married dads are trying to get rights uh, in law to be with their children uh, when the mother is going to marry somebody else who might want to adopt the child. The court says marriage has played a crucial role in developing the decentralized structure of our democratic society in recognizing that role and as part of an overarching concern for the best interests of children. State laws almost universally express an appropriate preference for the formal, that is, married family. So, you know, this is from the mid-1800s to the, the mid-1980s. Aspects of these cases are things like uh, the role that having a blood relationship with the child plays. So these are the cases distinguishing, say, foster families who want a role from a child's biological families. Another really important aspect of these cases is that when parents are seeking rights respecting children, these are unwed dads in particular, or they are seeking to do something with their kids, like, hey, come on out in the street and distribute religious tracts with me <laughs> against the child labor laws, the courts are very, very clear that the only time we give adults rights respecting children is as a predicate of their first assuming duties. And this is said again and again that adults have rights respecting children because they first have duties, okay? So in sum, you could say that this special status or preference for um, opposite sex partnerships had to do with the fact that they produced children, that through experience and sort of common sense observation, there was a thought that maybe parental orientation to them had some relationship to there being blood relationships with these kids. We now have the, the family systems theory and evolutionary theorists weighing in on this. They didn't even have that at the time. It was an intuition. And what you see is really an outward regarding perspective on children. Children are not for their parents. Parents are stewards through whom the children pass on their way to being adult citizens for a democracy. Now, now you turn to the leading state uh, Supreme Court same-sex marriage opinions and the Supreme Court's Windsor opinions and you find a very sharp break with this. No longer is there any notion that the state values marriage because it's the source of children or society. In fact, I think the most emphatic disclaimer of this would be the Goodridge opinion, the first state marriage opinion that said, we have no intention of stating a preference for however families get formed, none whatsoever, and we want to make that clear. Um, so, uh, and, and we have no preference for, and then they go on in the kind of gotcha way to the state attorney general saying you have allowed children into all kinds of familial situations through assisted reproductive technologies or adoptions. Now they don't acknowledge whether that's you know, a good thing, but they say you've done it and so we're not taking you seriously that even you think the formal family, mother and father bearing their natural children makes any difference. So why should we? In other words, you've already done something so we wash our hands of it without adjudicating whether it's a good idea or not, but gotcha you've already admitted that you don't care. <laughs> uh, and they point out about uh, being able to marry people who are infertile or elderly or whatever, overlooking all the arguments about the most common marital situation is a man and a woman who do have children. So when you look at what they do value in um, relationships, it's happiness, sexual intimacy, the dignity of the couple, a status in a society, benefits, security, identity formation through this expression of who it is I wish to marry and have a sexually intimate relationship with. And then, of course, um, uh, this, the benefits that the state allegedly gives to married people, although, as I'll say, it's a question whether you lose more or gain more from some of the new health care laws or tax laws, et cetera, being married or, or just living together as unmarried. That's kind of an outstanding question. But um, in any event, um, you don't see that they, you know, they disclaim that they care about couples that could produce children versus couples who would instead have children via adoption or from a prior heterosexual relationship through a custody order or assisted reproductive technology. The other thing, of course, that drops out logically in these cases is language that marriage is therefore a good place to be um, rearing children for the democracy, since they've already said we don't really 
value procreative relationships over intrinsically non-procreative ones, they don't state anything about marriage being a good place to form and rear children for the future. Uh, it just it doesn't logically follow from their first disclaimer. However, states say that they have an interest in this and that they think that opposite sex couples are probably a place the state ought to prefer um, because they can have children by accident, because they do have children, because hey, we don't know um, uh, what the future may hold um, for the well-being of children and let's just say the state has a right to decide to, to wait and see. Um, so, but this forces the courts to respond to the question, is that a compelling state of interest to have children reared with their, um, their biological moms and dads in opposite sex marriages? Um, and what you see here is, um, is, is really evidence of very little attention to children. You see, I mean, probably the most amazing egregious example had to be the Iowa Supreme Court's uh, like footnote that, oh, this is just stereotype and bias that children do better in one household for another. You see tiny amounts of time dealing with the data, claims like in the Perry case that this is settled beyond all reasonable doubt. And if you actually look, and I can't g go into this in this time that I have, if you actually look at this, you'll see that there are outstanding and huge methodological and bias questions on the dozens of studies that were claimed to show that there was no difference. And you have additional to that the fact that studies that weren't even about same-sex couples but that indicated things like a child missing a mother or a father had some trouble reworking um, their, um, their identity and their relationship with the opposite sex. You had, you had the fact that the literature on complementarity just isn't really sufficiently developed yet. Um, you had the literature on instability being a huge mediating factor, as, as, as already been said earlier, for child welfare, and the emerging literature from the Netherlands and now even from the U.S. and Canada about high, higher rates, much higher rates of instability in relationships um, uh, that are same sex versus opposite sex, and what does this portend for the children. So there were all these things that those courts could have dealt with, but instead, they gave it few lines and virtually no consideration of the data in a fair manner. Um, the other thing is that in place in same-sex marriage opinions, uh, this discussion of parental duty and uh, orientation toward children, you have instead in the opposite sex marriage opinions and in Windsor about how um, the if you give adults rights to a status they want for themselves, then outsiders will bring benefits to the children, money in particular and maybe respect. Uh, we hope, this is not by any means certain, that would lead to the children being better off. This, however, is completely, the children's well-being argument is completely in service to the argument that, that this is therefore why we should give adult rights, okay? It's an adult-centric, inward-looking argument. Um, there is some, as I said, nod to the former link between marriage and childbearing. No mention of the Supreme Court's 120 years worth of tradition anywhere in the state cases or in the Windsor case. But again, these just a few sentences regarding um, the, um, uh, the data, but utterly poorly done. Just absolutely unfaithful to the best interests of children or to even the right of the state to move slowly or with caution towards something very drastically new. There is, because these cases didn't even go that far, another thing they did not do is to examine what it would mean from, for even children created in um, same-sex households as a whole to, to, to normalize for them and for children as a whole, because these cases very clearly tried never to distinguish between what they were saying about the meaning of marriage for everybody and the meaning of children for everybody. They said it was the same across all kinds of couples. Because what they are affirming are children who come into same-sex households in ways that are very different from the way children come into um, opposite-sex households, they really didn't get around to discussing some of the underlying shift 
um, in, in the idea of the meaning or place of children. But by, by this I mean the following. Children come into same-sex households in large majority, probably over 80 percent. And this has been said not only by supporters of same-sex marriage but by opponents. The data is just clear. It's like 80 to 86 percent of children come into same-sex household rearing by a former heterosexual relationship by one of those um, adult now same-sex partners. Um, then another smaller percentage come in through adoption and through assisted reproductive technology. If you think about this, then what we are saying is that there is a new way of thinking about who children are in these. They are not immediately part of a network of kin with common genetic inheritance, family character, a place in society and in history. Um, they are more brought into the situation by a negotiating, a choosing, whether it's a picking of of gametes or, or embryos to choose or traits, whether it is a, a custody fight, whether it is a, a negotiation with the, with the former um, opposite sex partner, whether it is um, a choosing of a child from, uh, from an adoption situation. They, in other words, are far less in the mode of, of serendipitous gifts received. They are more chosen and then they are brought into a situation which is not a situation of union, but ab initio, a situation of separation, of, of disunion, of, of loss, something that we, we, we would used to think of in family law as a tragedy, not something to deliberately create or facilitate. In the case of a child brought into a, uh, an, an opposite sex union, um, while certainly there are families who do this through assisted reproductive technologies or adoption, there is more usually in the vast majority of cases an opportunity for the paradigm of the child being a gift received, whether, whether by accident or by the fact that you don't know who this child is going to be when you pick the person you're going to marry and then you end up having a child born this month versus this month versus this other month and a different child could be conceived at any one of those times. Um, in the case of any of the methods by which a child is brought into an opposite sex household, in other words, there is more of an opportunity for the child to be conceived under the paradigm of gift, brought into union, created out of a loving act between the mother and the father. In other words, the child is less theirs. It's more brought into being versus ordered into being, versus fought into place in that household. This is the subject of a marvelous essay. I have it with me if anybody would like to look at it, uh, by Marcel Gaucher, a, a French philosopher, in a, in a fabulous essay called Les Enfants du Désir, in, in the, the Children of Desire, uh, about just this reconceiving of who children are in one situation versus another in the new society where having children is more about choice. This doesn't just affect children coming in to same-sex households, however. It effectively sends a message, and Maggie was referring to this earlier, to all children in all marriages, these cases. It says, the state has absolutely no interest into whether or not you come into being or not. Procreation isn't a value of ours. It's just not a state value, number one. Number two, we haven't the slightest interest in whether or not you come into a situation where you know or are immediately connected to your biological parents. We're absolutely agnostic on that. We have um, no interest in the relationship between child outcomes and family structure. And in fact, we'll resort to paltry or even dishonest um, investigations into that in order to say that we checked that box. I went and did a line by line counting of the Massachusetts Constitutional Convention. And by 10 to 1, the mention of the word children was legislators saying, my children will be proud of me that I stood here today and did X, to every one mention of how children might fare under new family structures. My final uh, reflection on this. Um, I think that while um, all children are affected by these new messages coming out of the cases about who children are or aren't, in the context of marriage, I think the children who will be harmed the most are already our most vulnerable children. Children of Americans who are less privileged, minority, 
and poor. And I think this for the following reason, and I'll be about a minute to finish this. While the well-off reject as impractical or harmful for themselves and their children, the dissociation of children from marriage, while the well-off reject turning a blind eye to the importance of family structure with child welfare, and they do this by voting with their feet. They cohabit less often, they have fewer out of wedlock births, they have a tiny number of, of, of non-marital births actually if they're a college graduate. They uh, marry more often, they divorce less, et cetera. The poor, women and men of color, the less educated, uh, are much more vulnerable to social policies and messages from the powers that be that say that empowerment, or personal autonomy, soulmate relationships uh, are what is important about marriage. That marital childbearing, bringing a child into a situation with a mother and father, with all the human capital that provides, are just choices like any other choices. These are the same people buffeted the worst, and nobody is attending to the poor right now. Nobody. Okay? I, I happen to be um, working on a variety of, of issues in that area, and I'm just shocked by how few people are attending to the special disasters um, uh, among the poor right now who are not only buffeted by family disintegration, but by the economy, by education, by over-incarceration of males uh, that makes stable marital structures harder. The reconceiving children as about adult choices, dismissing their need for a permanent union for a mother and father and all the social capital that can provide as the new family law norms are no good. Your dean opened up this by talking about the U.S. historical uh, trajectory toward self-determination, autonomy, and equality. The rich can afford all that self-determination and equality. They have margins. The poor need solidarity, interdependence, and they need a certain message about the importance of marriage and parents in order to get there. Thank you very much. something ordered, I think, in about 10 minutes. But okay, it, well, it'll hang out a bit. So any later. questions for Francis? Uh, yeah. yeah, so if there are questions for Francis, we should get those first. And keep your questions short and make sure it's really a question. <laughs> Sorry, this is actually you, Francis. Uh, I have two questions for you because you're an elder. Uh, you talked about data. Um, I was talking about pushing, I think about pushing all the weapons down against Board of Education and the controversy that ensued from the court's seeming reliance on data that might change. Um, and some of the criticisms of the opinion <laughs> suggesting that maybe the constitutional rules might change if the data changed. To what extent do you think that data, good data, should be driving the constitutional discussion about same-sex marriage? That, that, that's a great question. I'll try to be brief. and. Um deference to the professors need to leave. Um, I think that data, both qualitative and quantitative, on this very difficult issue is definitely an important part of it. So for instance, we don't have any data that is large enough yet on the question of what do spouses bring uniquely to and what do they bring in a complementary way? I've dealt with uh, Ross Park, who is a, uh, just a leading um, investigator of the family in this area, um, who's in favor of same-sex marriage, but he says, well, I, I, he says I am, but in spite of the fact that it may be that opposite-sex couples have these gigantic complementary resources that they bring to, to childbearing enterprise, but we just don't know it yet. So I, th I think it should matter. And, and, and what's insulting to me about what I see so far is the, the manhandling of what we do have, and, and also the refusal to allow sort of um, things to take their time, because this is children we're talking about here, and we have a responsibility to the vulnerable. Um, so I have questions for um, both Professor uh, Goldscheider and um, Professor, I mean, and uh, Ms. Gallagher. I, um, but I, I don't know if I should ask them both, but I, I'll go ahead since, um, since Professor Goldscheider's leave. <laughs> um, 
So um, I understand your, uh, or I'm just trying to spin out some of the implications of what you were talking about. And I mean, I gather that sort of broadly, it seems that the politics around working mothers um, sort of has a lot to do with our views about gender roles and our concerns about um, maintaining traditional gender roles. And then um, we can sort of leap to that and say that a lot of the concern about same-sex couples is about the same thing, maybe. Um, and I wonder how much, and about the division of labor, I guess, between you know home and, and the broader world, these separate spheres, right? And I wonder how much uh, you know, a, a, the movement toward legalizing same-sex marriage and um, normalizing same-sex marriage might actually, in a very uh, concrete way, kind of start to impact uh, that division of labor. I guess, you know, as we have less assumptions about, you know, what, what a married couple is composed of, a man and a woman, as, as it could, you know, we have more couples that are two men or two women, um, is that going to kind of change the, the calculus in terms of um, the workplace and um, views about who's going to take leave, who can work, how many hours, what, you know, what our gendered assumptions are about those sorts of things in the future. And so I wonder how much, you know, literally that might, not just in a sort of general sense of what our views are about gender roles, but also um, in a very concrete way may impact um, how we negotiate around divisions of labor um, in the workplace and outside of the workplace. Um, should I ask my other question or should I stop? Okay. Um, <coughs> okay, and then I have a question for uh, Maggie Gallagher, which is, um, I guess I want to dispute the um, the characterization of of um, not legalizing same-sex marriage, so states where same-sex marriage is legal, as an absence of affirmation. And I I see an analogy here to one of the areas that I write in, which is um, uh, religion clauses of the First Amendment and religious symbolism, uh, official government religious speech, sort of, which is often official Christian speech, um, which is, you know, I agree that that's another area where um, folks who support official religious speech tend to experience dismantling of it as, you know, as a message of um, exclusion to them or a message that uh, their views are um, unwelcome or, or uh, you know, a, a similar thing to what you have described as your experience of reading Wim Windsor. And I, I have to confess that I just can't see it that way because I, I think that, you know, the, the regime in which there's only one version of marriage that is legal is, is not just merely failing to affirm other versions. It's really, you know, excluding them. And, and, you know, folks aren't asking to replace their version of marriage with the one that exists. They're just asking to kind of open it up to more versions. So, I, you know, I think that, and, and when you say, you know, that is not legal, it's not accepted, that's not just an absence of affirmation. It is really a message of exclusion in a way that opening Could up marriage question, <laughs> to different forms <coughs> isn't. So, um, yeah, well, so I, I guess I'm questioning whether, you know, is that really I just got, I got the question, but okay. I think I can pick up the original ball and toss it to Maggie successfully, so let me give it a try. I mean, as I was thinking about this presentation and so forth, because I have not, I, have to, I don't even know why you all invited me, honored as I am, n done a lot of work on same-sex marriage, but it does seem to me that this is a window, a time, when there's a lot of family heterogeneity whether it's the growth of single parents or the you know, contestation between men and women over gender roles of all kinds, that we're in a period of rapid change, great flux, great heterogeneity, and it makes it much more um, logical, um, you know, accessible, in fact, to say, okay, while well, we're widening it up to this kind and that kind and the other kind, why not this other kind, which has claims of its own? My own theoretical position, actually, and then I'll hand it to Maggie, is that we're, we, were, we will be moving toward a new um, consensus on um, um, two parents working and flexible gender roles in the home and in the workplace. And I expect that there will be children, and uh, you know, I'm a follower of Malthus. We said he was all wrong when he said the passion between the sexes was necessary, and that's why there would be a lot of children, which is what he was saying. And of course, we all knew there was birth control so we could have our passion and eat it too, but <laughs> as it were. But in fact, I do think that the, the pair bond, 
whether it's homosexual or heterosexual, and in the substantial majority of the cases it is heterosexual, is going to be with us and that Mal Malthus was right. So whether we have to divide things up this way or that way, we are still gonna have couples and those couples are still going to have children. Um, but being a good liberal, I think it's okay for <laughs> same-sex couples to do the same. And now I can give it to Maggie. Um, I get that you find it really hard, and I guess that's part of the point I was making. It is extremely hard when you uh, have to, to see what you're asking of it. In your eyes, you're not asking anything of anyone else. And I think it's probably because the view of you know marriage has already in your head been redefined as something to do with commitment, love, and intimacy, and governed by civil law, right? So, um, so in that case, we're not taking anything away from anyone. We're just adding more options to the table. But if you could wrap your head around a person who believes that marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad, that that's the reason why we have marriage as a civil institution. Uh, and that achieving that for children in actual life takes an enormous amount of effort and work, uh, including cultural work. And then step into the world where now, I, I can tell you, I went around the country and I said that for 10 years, and by the end of the year 2000, uh, almost no, uh, the form of it said the ideal for a child is a married mom and dad, provided that marriage is not high conflict or violent, almost nobody disagreed with. But now it is intensely disagreed with, and this view is described as uh, bigoted by its nature, right? So uh, at a minimum, I would say, even if you think that's true, and therefore this view of marriage should be discarded, I would ask you to recognize the truth that you are asking people to, not, not just, we're not just adding to a menu of marriage options, you're asking people to give up something that a lot of people believe is very fundamental and core about what makes marriage important. Yes, love really matters, but there's lots of loving relationship in the world, and I don't, I don't believe the government would be involved in marriage or that marriage would be a virtually universal human institution if it didn't have these deep roots in this special need to bring together male and female. I think it will happen more often. I, I, it's hard for me to understand how, and I, as I said, I hope that I'm proven wrong by this, and I hope that David Blankenhorn is, and, and people like, figure out a way to sustain the goods that this old marriage idea captured under the new marriage equality regime. But it seems to me the, the fundamental core moral norm now is that you can't distinguish between same-sex and opposite-sex couples and if you see something special or important about opposite sex couples that is not shared by same sex couples, that's you focusing on something that's discriminatory or, or, or problematic. So I think it's a reprioritizing at a minimum of the goods of marriage and the culture. It's a choosing between different visions of what marriage is and why it matters. And because it's being done as an equality norm, it doesn't end up with just everyone's views are equally good. Yes, I will still be able to enter an opposite sex marriage in that sense, but my views of what marriage are are becoming increasingly problematic to hold and increasingly subject to punishments, both some of which are cultural and some of which are legal. And I say, would say, think back to Melissa the baker. You know, she, you, you may not, you know, you may not think, you may think her views of marriage are bogus, but she doesn't want to bear fault when, witness to what a marriage is. And both the law and the elite culture have made it very hard for her to bake cakes and keep it without, if her views of marriage become known. So something is being asked. And the rest of us, when we see that happening to her, learn something about our place in society by whether or not people think this is a good or bad thing to happen to a woman like her. Lunch is available in room A62 out that way. Uh, I think this has been a great panel. I think they deserve a big round of applause.